I think the big question of the right of the party that they will be asking themselves is why are you, should anyone vote Conservative if you're doing exactly the same things that Labour are doing, would do? It's like they're signalling they've run out of ideas. Where can we get some ideas from? Oh, from the Labour front bench. Yeah. Well, why shouldn't the country then go for the real thing? Hello and welcome to The Political Forecast. Shooting the breeze, kicking up a storm and maybe raining on a parade or two with people in politics who've been there and done it and know what's going on. This week, the budget and what it means for the timing of the election. With me is Gary Gibbon, our political editor at Channel 4 News. And who better for a budget week than our two guests? The former Conservative Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, whose mini budget of 2022 is still being argued over, and Labour's Harriet Harman, who as acting leader twice knows all about replying to budgets. Both are standing down at the next election to have a degree of freedom to speak their mind as we analyse what's going on, highlight what the main parties are not talking about, and since it's in the title, we'll try and forecast the political weather a bit as we get closer to the election. Now, we start each political forecast by trying to get inside the one story you're seeing all over your social media or hearing about down the pub. Now, the price of a drink is staying the same. So let's start with the budget. Gary, I mean, Jeremy Hunt's budget is landing sort of fairly gently right now. Um, but, you know, people are saying, well, it doesn't feel like there's going to be an election in May. I mean, how, how did it feel watching him? It was intriguing in the chamber Jeremy Hunt's not the most divisive figure in politics. There are other contenders for that title. And he can sometimes be listened to in pin drop silence. But in the Commons yesterday, there was a concerted effort, uh, uh, no accident from uh, Labour MPs, to make a lot of noise uh, for the first half hour of his speech. And it succeeded in just sort of diminishing the occasion a bit. He never really had uh, command of the House. They went a bit quieter after a while, but by that stage, everyone was in a bit of a fug. And the other thing about the atmosphere you noticed was when Jeremy Hunt was stealing Labour policies, you've always got to be aware as Chancellor, haven't you, uh, what's happening behind you. And they were silent. The Tory MPs not making a noise. They cheered at the end, but... That was a telling moment. I mean, quasi, Qua, you, you've done this. I and mean, then your, yeah. your budget speech was really kind of punchy, confident. Yes. It was, so, you know, you've got to, you've got to understand that the, there's always a context. And, you know, we were a new government coming in or new prime minister coming in and obviously want to set the ground running. And it was a bit, it was overexcitable, like overexciting. And I think what Jeremy's trying to do, um, and I think he's done this relatively successfully, is just calm uh, things down and lower the temperature politically. And also, you've got to remember, his style is very much a kind of consensual, almost like a centrist style. I mean, you can argue whether that's the reality. But his manner has always been very considered. Um, and I think that uh, he's not one for the flourishes that we've seen other chancellors do, like Gordon Brown. Even George Osborne, you know, he wasn't a natural orator, but he was somebody who, who liked the flourishes. And also, he had a very well-organised, uh, and you'll appreciate this, when you're in the chamber... Uh, and you're a minister speaking at the dispatch box, you're very conscious of the support behind you. And that can be very well organised. And with, in George Osborne's day, all the eager young backbenchers mm -hmm. were very, very well organised by the whips to cheer at the right places. It's it's a bit of theatre. So, so he didn't have the support even while he was doing so the speech? So I'm not sure. I mean, I think there was support there, but I'm not sure how coordinated it was. And I think clearly Labour had an operation. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of razzing him up uh, during the speech. I mean, that's coordinated. It's not spontaneous. And that's how, you know, a lot of the, the craft of, of the chamber um, is, is, is like theatre production. You know, you've got to get the people doing the right lines, the right interventions at the right time. And that's something that members of the public don't nece aren't necessarily conscious of. Harriet, I mean, you've had to reply to budget speeches, which is a total nightmare, isn't it? I mean, because you, you, you've no idea what's coming. Well, usually it is a total nightmare, but I think it was a very different experience for Keir Starmer this time in responding to the budget speech. And usually the Chancellor gives the budget statement, but it's not the shadow Chancellor who replies, it's the, it's the leader of the party that replies. But this was a very different situation from a normal budget. Normally, the Chancellor has some surprises and he, he robbed himself of any surprises. So that was the first thing, that Keir Starmer knew exactly everything that was going to be in it. Normally, it's a time for 
the party to sort of rally behind the chancellor because after all you've got the chancellor that's, that's right. a big thing you know we've got lots of things in the labor party we we haven't got the chancellor yeah. and it's a moment of a bit of hegemony but something it felt like there was something going so, on in the tory party that he wasn't allowed his moment of hegemony well, I, I think we gave him his space but i think the main Except thing Suella Braverman got up and then said straight away actually this is for the birds, because we need loads more tax cuts. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. there was no polite interval. No, um, and and also the other thing is because it's so much in the context of a forthcoming general election, the outside context of what people are saying was big in the chamber because all of us MPs on all sides are out on the doorstep all the time, mm -hmm. listening to what people are sure. saying about their own finances. So it was sort of less academic than, yeah, it, than I mean, it might be. I, I think that's very interesting. I think the point about the party rallying around the chancellor is, is a very well-made one. And the party is quite fractured at the moment. I and mean, I can't even keep count of the number of groups that in the emails I'm being said, do you want to join this group? Do you want to join that group? So it is quite a febrile situation. And also I think everyone's conscious, as Harriet said, that there's going to be an election. So that changes the dynamic. It's not like, you know, some of, when I was a backbencher, some of the Osborne budgets, even the ones that went badly, um, were cheered to the rafters. There was lots of theater. There was lots of uh, stage craft, if mm. you like, in terms of what I was talking about. At this time, it seemed less coordinated. And I also think the reason why they leak everything is that in my budget, we didn't leak stuff. And so the markets were surprised. So now there's a, there's a massive uh, uh, sort of presumption that you're going, to, you're going to tell everyone everything so that when you actually do the, the speech, there are no surprises. Because we were told that actually the 45p thing, when you got rid of that, Nobody, no, and we kept that under wraps, but actually doing that can spook people. So I think so now- So better to just get forward, it all out. Yeah, I mean, in the old days, everything was, was, was kept, you know, you know, to the chest. It was, all, it was all very sort of secretive. Whereas I think the way that modern budgets have evolved and the way that market reaction uh, is calibrated means that most of this stuff uh, is already out there. So what groups have you joined? I haven't joined any of them. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> but they've all got names that, you know, I can't remember. I mean, a lot of them have research group in the title. So there's the Northern Research Group. They do group, a lot of research, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was told, I think when I was a student, that anything with the, any group that had the word European in it was anti-European by, by definition. So the European Research Group was, you know, a Europe, Eurosceptic. I mean, the, the way thing. this is landing, though, it, it shouldn't be a surprise, does it? Because he, he's played the same game twice now. And, and, and in November... Yeah. They did the national insurance cut and everybody said, yes, but the tax, you know, burden yeah, sure. has gone, is going up to historic highs. And so there wasn't a lot of credit and kind of the same thing has happened again. Today. It's It's groundhog, both in terms of the measures to an extent, take aside, uh, they put aside the, uh, the ones stolen from Labour, but also in terms of the economic forecast, not much no. changed <clears throat> really. And if they're holding on for a later election, they've just got to be hoping uh, that there's enough uh, room to make things yeah. really different, different, different in the autumn and they can detonate something that really explodes. Well, because we all, we all went into yesterday going, right, is this the budget that sets the scene for an early election suddenly? Well, I didn't you think. Know. I never thought. Because, I, I mean, uh, Harriet's probably been in a similar situation to me, but when you're kind of in the bunker, when you're you know, a chancellor or, I, dare I say, a prime minister or, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a senior person in the government. And I saw this with the Lib Dems. It's very, it's, it's very counterintuitive to call something early. I mean, Theresa May did it with a bad effect. Um, but I think they, I, I never thought they were going to go for May. And if you look at the May election, I think the local elections are the 2nd of May. I mean, it's right at the beginning of May. So if, if, this, we were, if we were going to have a, a May election, we'd have to be calling the election in week, 19 right. days' time. Yeah, that's right. And it just did no, not no, feel like you're right. You're because, right. you know, the chance the Prime Minister has to stand on the steps of Downing Street and say, calling that's the right. election. Then we all have to go to the House of Commons and do what's called the wash-up, you know, salt that's out right. all the different that's bits right. of legislation not much to wash up and agree. That's right. that's <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. And then the election starts. So you have to work quite a far yeah, way back. And right. it didn't feel like in no, 19 days' no. time. We're no, going to be I mean, an I mean, and and that's quite a short time frame. I mean, I remember the Theresa May election. I remember vividly. It was called on the 18th of April, and the election was in June. So it was about six or seven week period. And um, if Harriet is right, and we have an election on the 2nd of May, we're already in that seven week period, pretty much. All. So I, I don't see it. So, so, so why? Because Labour is still sort of braced. You know, I was talking to somebody 
uh, yesterday who was saying, no, well, we, you know, it still might happen. You just never know because things aren't going to get any better is the point. <laughs> you know, if he can't cut income tax now, he's not going to be able to cut income tax suddenly in, in the autumn. He's going to have a summer of boats arriving on the you know, on English shores, um, you know, he, there's, there's no reason to think it's going to be any easier at the moment in the autumn than in, than in May. So why not go now? Well, I think we, we can't really second guess. All we can do is know that he's got the control and right. we haven't. And therefore, it would be stupid for us not to be ready. So we're determined we will be ready. But me sitting back and looking at it, I think it will be November, but the party will be completely on an election footing like every day I, I from now, albeit it's I unlikely. I think what you say is absolutely right, because it's, it's no use saying, well, we don't think it's going to be made. You've got to be prepared for any eventuality. And, and people do odd things like Theresa May calling it early. That's right. But actually, I think you're completely right about there's such an instinct against calling an election early. Yeah. If you're in power, yeah, you don't right. want to do anything that might give it to I the agree. other I side. So, and yeah, remember right. the difficulty Gordon had in deciding that's right. whether or not to have an election before he actually needed to have it. And because the, uh, you can go into an election points ahead yeah, I mean, right. with the opposition points ahead and you can still... Yeah, so, so I think you're... So, so the, the issue with the Theresa May... Uh, snap election was, and it was very strange. But she would said seven times that she wasn't going to do an election. And so when she called it, I mean, I was flying back. It was, the, it was over the Easter, and I remember I had about a hundred WhatsApp messages, and they all said general election. And I thought, well, I mean, that's not here because the prime minister ruled it out. And of course, it was. And the point about that was that she was twenty points ahead, and she she called it because she thought she was going to win a bigger majority. That was the whole point. The whole point wasn't to lose the majority. The whole point was to gain the majority. So to call an early election... And she came back with fewer MPs that's right. afterwards. And they were absolutely furious. She didn't even need to call it. And exactly. Rishi will think, they'll blame me, all of them, that's because right. they'll think he didn't even need to call so, it. So I think you're right. And I think that the chances of him calling an election after the Theresa May election, uh, experience, when we're 20 points behind, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see an early election. But I might be wrong. I mean, Gary, what, what, why would it, is it li literally just a question of imagining something turns up that makes things better? Or, or is there any other reason to think things get better for them? There are, I mean, interest rates uh, will presumably uh, turn in a downward direction. Inflation is on the way down. But how much of that will translate into uh, people's lives, a lot of people will be hopping onto higher mortgage uh, rates anyway, just because there's a lag effect there. I think there's a bit of, um, there, there, there's a lot of human psychology here, yeah. isn't there? I mean, if you're Rishi Sunak, he, he thinks he's really good at sitting down with a whole load of problems, uh, getting all the experts in the room uh, from Whitehall and outside, analysing a problem and coming up with a solution. He thinks that that is something that he brings to the party. Mm. And he thinks if he just carries on doing that, yeah, that's right. surely things will and get also, better and people will appreciate it. And him. also there's the human psychology of every day your prime minister is an extraordinary privilege. And so... And the, a bigger Wikipedia entry. And a big... <laughs> and so, I mean, I remember reading, you know, 78, 79. I mean, I wasn't there, but uh, I think it was Bernard Donnie who said, well, a number ending in nine is better than a number ending in eight in terms of if you're going to leave the government. I mean, it sounds flippant, but there's the human uh, desire if you're in charge or responsible and have got an incredibly fulfilling job, to want to prolong that. That's so let's right. just talk about how this is landing, though, now mm. with Tory MPs, mm. with, with people like you. Mm. Um, and when you get a sense of that, I mean, w with your budget, when did you get a sense of how the, what, what the reaction so was the first, and when the markets the were weekend, panicking? The weekend and then, and then the, the next week and then... When you're already out of the country? No, no, no. This, so so I, was, I, was, I was only out... In, in, in Washington, about three or four weeks after the budget, right? It was it, it was it was a, it was a, it was a few weeks. It wasn't just days. Um, but I think I think I'll be nervous about the Sunday uh, and the weekend press. That's usually. And I remember from my days when I was PPS to Philip Hammond, we always used to say, "Well, if the budget's on Wednesday, mm -hmm. you, you've got to see what happens to the on the weekend press because that's when people really." The journalists and the Pasty lobby. Tax, the yeah, that caravan was awesome. tax, and everything unravels. You know. That's right. And he, I mean, that was 2012. Yeah. That was George Osborne. And I, that so was now is 20. the critical time in terms of reaction. Yeah, so I think the weekend is when people are going to be, be looking at this thing. So, so, if, so what are Tory MPs so going to be saying? I think that the, people on, broadly on the right of the party want tax cuts because 
and I, I have some sympathy with this. I think if you're a conservative government and you pride yourself on being the party of low unfunded taxation, unfunded tax cuts, they still want unfunded. They, they, tax yeah, cuts. They, 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 they would probably um, suggest that they would want to reduce or reduce the rate of spending increases, not reduce spending, public spending. But and that's and he, he announced that actually in in in, in the budget um, last year. But I think that the you know if you're a conservative party, modern conservative party, and I think even historically. Low taxes is your is one of your thing. So you want to be able to campaign on the idea that actually you're the person, you're the party that are going to reduce people's tax burden. And so if you're having the highest taxes in 70 years, it's a difficult uh, game or, 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 or place uh, to project your what your values are and who you are. That's the, the view of the right. The center of the party would be more cautious and say we've got to be responsible, and I, I totally understand that as well. But the problem with that is that going into an election, if you're offering essentially what the Labour Party are offering, it's very difficult to see you know, why people should vote for you if you're doing exactly what the Labour Party are going to do. And that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. And, and that was what happened yesterday in terms of stealing Labour ideas, wasn't it? The, 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 it's, it would be reasonable to look at what they did and go, well, Labour must have some good ideas. Um, well, I, look, I wouldn't have done that. I think it's, you know, essentially you're playing, because it's almost like a sort of, um, you know, battle. I mean, you're playing on their ground. You know, you're fighting the, the election on their ground. That's what you don't want to do. You want to fight on your ground. Um, and I think that's, a, that's a, a question that people will be asking. So do you think people are, are going to be restive over the next couple I, of years? I don't think that budget shifted the dial. I don't think it was intended to. And you've got to remember there's another seven or eight months. I mean, if, if it's not in May, it'll be in October or November. Uh, and that's still a long time in modern politics to craft a message. And I'm sure the polls will, will, will close. I mean, they'll narrow, as they always do. So I think playing a longer game makes a lot more sense strategically as well as, you know, spending longer in office. And, and do you think those, the, the right of the party would, would like him to be given the heave-ho now, that that was his last parliamentary so I think event? Big, I think the big question of the right of the party that they will be asking themselves is why are you, should anyone vote Conservative if you're doing exactly the same things that Labour are doing, would do? That's, that's the question. Now, you can, you can answer that in lots of different ways. But I think, I mean, Michael Portillo used to have this phrase, clear blue water. He used that years ago, but but there's a sense where people on the right want to see clear blue water between, okay, this is what Labour want to do, and and we're we're offering something different, um, and I think that's important for a lot of our MPs. That's what I saw in their sullen faces. You were sitting in the chamber uh, at eye level. I was looking down from above, yes. but that's what I saw in the silent Tory uh, faces when uh, well, you saw when, they, when they, the they, smash they... and grab raid went on Labour yeah. on Dom policy. I, I saw. What on earth just happened? We've been argue, we've been given a line to argue against this stuff. For years. Yeah, so parties do. I mean, Osborne used to do this sort of thing, and I think Gordon did as well. Um, you know, in the early part of his, his chancellorship. But but to but do it's that, different if you do it from a position of strength than if you do it from a position of weakness. That's true. It's like they're signalling they've run out of ideas. Where can we get some ideas from? Oh, from the Labour front bench. Yeah. Well, why shouldn't the country then go for the real thing rather than... I get you that know, So you're left with, you've caused the problems. Mm. But when it comes to solutions, oh, it's Labour. So I kind of, I think that, but I do think that, that there still seems to be a big argument going on. And, you know, obviously you've reflected it. There's real instability at the moment in on the Conservative benches. Yeah. And... In a way, one of the things that Rachel's trying to project is that if people in the economy and in the country want stability, mm. then we will be stable. But that's the political challenge for us because as the financial circumstances get more and more difficult and therefore the possibility for optimism sort of shrinks, then the political management and the political mm. discipline yes, is right. going to have to be even greater than it was in 1997. And, you know, I remember how painful it was mm. to take over a situation and to say to everybody, we've finally got into government, but actually you are going to have to wait a bit longer before that, all the things we want to do. And you had point. growth then. Sorry? And you had growth then. Yeah, we had yeah. two and a half percent growth. But to do yeah. it, with, we're waiting for growth. Yeah, I think that, you know, Rachel and the front bench team are signalling that people 
are going to have to be, you know, because she is absolutely determined that she is not going to say th one thing in opposition and do something different in government. And the political corralling that is going on around that is, is immense. But I think it's not because she thinks it's electorally necessary, although obviously it is, mm. but she actually believes that's the best way to run the economy. She's, she's not, I mean, Gordon had a good reputation amongst economists, but he was a political chancellor. He wasn't oh. an economist. Rachel's an economist who's He's actually a... doing a very strong political job. It's, it's... But she, she's now got quite a, a problem, hasn't she? Because if there's going to be an autumn election, she's got to come up with some ways to make her sums add up again now that two of her big ideas have been taken by this chancellor. So that money's not available anymore to pay for the for the health service or sure. for whatever's left of the environmental yeah. package yeah, that with Evelyn. That was part of the political... And that was, yeah. the, that was, that the, was the trap. The, yeah. But obviously she, she doesn't want to do something that he then nicks in the next um, yeah. awesome fiscal event and does you know pulls the same trick. So, so she's yeah. got to sort of somehow balance That's this right. question of, of, of credibility and, and having plans with not getting herself in a mess again so with the same is, problem. This is the match funding. This is the idea that you can offer people things like more dental appointments, cuts in waiting lists, breakfast clubs for primary school kids. Mm. You can offer them, but you don't have to risk the economy because you show how you're going to pay so for this, it. But this is so the... she she shows you can pay for it by the windfall levy, by the non-dons, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then that is not available when we come into government because this government has already yeah. taken it. So what she'll be needing to do is to look around if she hasn't probably already been doing that, because after all, them taking the non-DOM issue was already signaled. So they will have already been actually working out. If we want to stick with the breakfast cuts and cu yeah. cutting the way But do you is, announce we've it got and to risk find... Jeremy Hunt or well, whoever's there the, nicking that one? The nearer you get to an election, the less scope there is for the Tories to nick it. Um, and but we've got to show our workings to give people confidence. So this, this is, is the, the this is the this same is the point issue with the OBR. This is the, this is the trap. This is the doom loop because the way the OBR works and it's it's a very you know George Osborne set it up is that for every uh, tax cut you've got to find spending reductions or you've got to raise taxes elsewhere or and borrow. The issue, or, or borrow and they won't allow they you. Did, uh, yeah. yeah, but the, the problem is with that is that. If you're not having any growth or as much growth, and it's a, it's a, it's across the Western world. I mean, it's across, uh, you know, post-COVID, high, very high indebtedness. Um, it's very difficult to kind of break out of that if you, if, if, you, if, if the economy isn't growing as fast as you'd like it to. And that's the problem she's going to have to deal with because it won't be simply a question of balancing the books if public spending is going up at 5%, let's say, and, um, and your tax revenue, the economy itself, is only growing up at, you know, 0.5%. At some point, you assume you can't keep raising taxes to, 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 to fund that. And that's the problem, fundamentally, that she's going to face if she gets in uh, this year. So were you, were you when, I mean, when you decided not to have the OBL, yeah. and, and you know, you, you've since said, well, that was the problem. I think, that was a, I think um, there were lots of things that we should have done slightly differently, but that, you know, hindsight's a beautiful did, thing. Did you, did you, were you actually trying to sort of break the whole OBR I think, I, I system? Think that was, I think it was very much the Prime Minister's view, and I shared it, that if you were working within the OBR, it, it constrains what you do. So essentially, you, you, so you, want, you just wanted to sort of get rid of you, it. You want to not, not, not get rid of it per se, but I think we, we wanted to sort of kickstart it. But she'll find exactly the same problem because but it, the. But it's sorry. quite, can I just ask this? It's quite odd because we didn't have the OBR no, you before 97, no. but we were absolutely terrified of spooking the markets and sure. actually spending more than they felt that sure. we could do. Sure. So. We, we didn't have the OBR discipline, no. but we still had that financial markets discipline. And that's why I was very curious in the run up to your budget, because I thought he can't be going to do that because mm. it will spook the markets. It will put up interest rates. I just can't work out why you thought that it would be all right. And so that, you would, think... that, that the markets... I thought, well, perhaps they think because they're a Tory government no, that no, they so, will get so, a sort so, of, so, you know, free pass the, the, from the, the issue, market. But the of course, wasn't, that wasn't going to no, happen. The issue was overreach, like a lot of things that go wrong. The issue, the, the initial insight, and I, I think, still think, if we'd stuck to what Liz Truss had campaigned on, which was essentially the NI, um, you know, re reversing that increase and not putting up corporation tax, that was about 35 billion. 
And I think where we went wrong was adding more stuff that the markets hadn't anticipated. Why, yeah. why did you then? Um, well, that's we, we could talk about that. I mean, that's that. There's always mission creep in these things. There's always things you know we wanted to get in, we want to get things done. She was in a hurry, wasn't um, she? We were, you know, we wanted. It, it was too much of a hurry, in my view, looking back. Um, and that's and that's what we did. Um, and it, and and that's what happened. And the other thing that I regret was that we should have had something serious on spending at the same time. So if you'd literally stuck to the things you'd campaigned on and delayed the statement so that you could ha you could have a, a, a balance fee on the spending side, and, and the markets would not have reacted in the way that they did. Um, but there was, we were doing, trying to do too much too quickly. But I think the other thing is that, you know, and this was very clear in the budget, is that this is the, the context, that is that that people know that happened. And although Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are trying to present themselves as a different government, people th think of the Conservative government, they think about their mortgage going up mm. as a result of that fiscal event. And therefore, they do, you know, blame the Conservatives for that. So I think that that is still very much a framing for what's in people's minds. Uh, let, let's move on, because because we want to spend a little bit of time not just talking about what politicians are talking about, because uh, that's all well and good. Um, but there are lots of things politicians are not talking about on both sides. And I think we should spend a little bit of time just uh, digging into to that. I mean, the thing that sort of emerged yesterday from the OBR was the whole issue of immigration and how my, new migrants to Britain are boosting growth um, and that they factored all of this into their future calculation. Well, the OBR say in terms that uh, uh, the growth levels they've factored in are dependent on this high level of immigration, and yet the government hasn't formally signed off on that and said that's no. what we're aiming for, and that's but that's it's all about target. the figure. So and I it don't makes know, Labour uncomfortable as well. But I, I don't know what their assumption is. I mean, I I I I, I, I think it's over three hundred thousand. Their yeah. old assumption was about one hundred fifty thousand. And now it's getting now it's three hundred thousand. And three hundred thousand. But that's, you know, we had 745,000. I mean, but, but, I would but three, argue that if 300,000 a year gets you to quite a number after a parliament. It does, but we had 745,000 last year, Gary. That's the point. That's why it's, an, mm. it's such a, a, a live issue but this, this on, is on no, the political this is no, right. This is not helpful for Labour either, is no. it? I mean, the idea of accepting immigration at over 300,000 net a year in order to reach the current growth predictions, which are pretty thin. Mm. Um, is, is not, I mean, you can see why nobody wants to talk about it. Well, except that I think we, we have been talking about it, Labour have been talking about it, but because they've been talking about what lies behind that. So basically, if there's a shortage of care workers and you have to bring in care workers, is it because you haven't got bursaries for midwives? Is it because you are, haven't got a proper training programme for social care? And so th there's that. Then there's the question of bringing in skilled people and is there a really grounded, effective long-term skills plan, which we'd say there isn't. So I think you have to kind of dissect it bit by bit. And then it, when it comes to students, you know, we need foreign students but, here. Our university But it's always presented as either or, isn't it? No, no, no. But also, and, and it's also, not. Also, also, let's, yeah, you know, but you we, have to unpack it. You can't just... We can, we can unpack things, but what people hear are the numbers. You know, they hear 300,000, oh, that's the size of a small town, or 700,000, that's the size of Leeds. That's what they're hearing. And that's informing, rightly or wrongly, the political debate. I mean, let's just talk briefly about the other thing that nobody wants to talk about, which is tax rises. I mean, you know, Paul Johnson at the IFS and everybody else says, look, wh whoever's in power, the likelihood is we're looking at tax rises yeah. of some kind. Absolutely. Because the numbers don't add up. If you look at departmental spending after 2025, because some budgets like health are getting above 1% increases, other departments are looking at big holes, yeah. potential cuts. And no government's going to wear that. The, the, a Conservative government, if it's re-elected, isn't going to stick to these spending totals. Um, so, but this is the doom loop that, funnily enough, both Liz Truss and myself, obviously, but also I'm hearing it from the Labour Party. I mean, the, the growth agenda is the most important agenda because the, the logic of where we are is if public spending is going up much faster than your economy is going up, you, as Harriet said, you've got to either put up taxes or borrow more which is deferred taxation. And that's the problem that, that any government will face. Are, are we looking at a rerun of 97 then, where um, lots of people said the Labour government should have been much gutsier and not stuck to Tory spending targets um, and done a lot more in those first two years of the first term of the Labour government? Well, I, yeah, I, 
I don't agree with that. I mean, we we made a promise, and you know, we'd lost the election in seventy nine, and we lost it again in eighty three, mm. and we you know eighty seven and ninety two. We lost and lost and lost, and we actually said, look, we know what's bothering you. You think we're going to actually put your taxes up and then throw the money down the drain by spending it unwisely, and actually, we're making you a solemn promise: we are not going to put your taxes up. And it was a, a promise to the people, but it was also a promise to the market. So the idea that we could get in and they say, ha, huh, we've discovered our inner boldness. I mean, I, I it's just not possible. So it was immensely painful to do and went against all our instincts, not to actually rescue the health service, rescue the education system, tackle all the poverty there was. But if you make that commitment, you have absolutely got to stick yeah, it with was, it. Yeah, it was an extraordinary time because I remember, I mean, I wasn't in the house at the time, I was... I think a student. And I had to get fired as a result. You did. Of, you you know, know, what the first, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can I just make some very, complaint very here? Very self-deprecating yeah. remark. Mm. No, I remember that. I was a, I was a student following Those it closely. Fired people. That's right. Remark, no, yeah. I think most people get in, in the end get fired either by the electorate or the prime minister. Gary and I will remember that. Yeah. Uh, but, no, but, <laughs> but that. But that. But that. But that parliament was extraordinary because, and I said I got into trouble for saying this in Tory party conference twelve years ago in 2012. I said it was the most conservative, fiscally small c conservative government of the century. Because the bud for four years, the the budget was either balanced or in surplus. And actually, I don't think that, I can't think of a parliament where that's happened. Um, and so, and I said that, and people said, "Oh, you know, are you supporting Labour?" I said, "I'm not supporting Labour. I don't agree with Labour." But it was a pretty extraordinary time. But we were laying plans. You know, we were laying plans and then for you, delivering you spent later the money. on. Yeah, then yeah, you then spent we the did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ken Clark, of course, who left you that spending settlement said he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. Maybe did, but, he didn't have to, but they, Labour's haunted. They didn't need to, no, because right. they were the Tories. Yeah, yeah. We were so, Labour, and so people had doubts about us. It was we had very, to allay yeah. those doubts. I mean, but we just had to. Peering into the crystal ball, living through what you did in those years, and knowing that if Labour were to come in, say, later this year, it's going to be the problems of 97... And some. ...cubed. Yeah. How on earth... Does that hold together? You don't have to look very far into the crystal ball, do you, to see five tribes, you know, a Labour Mark Francois leading them all out to sure. uh, lead a rebellion, all sorts of uh, destabilising forces inside Labour. They could come up quite quickly, couldn't they? No, I don't think so, because I think that basically, if and when we get in, that will be what everybody has wanted for so long. So that kind of binds people together. Nobody wants, having been out of government since 2010, you get in and then everybody rocks the How boat. There will last? be no appetite. I think that's a very good point. It lasts, it, it lasts as long as the political management and the reality of the plans sustain confidence. I think it's a very good point. So it's, but you know, I think they're, you know, see, I think they're seriously good people, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves. I know you think you know, I would expect it. But, but so, no, the, I'm not. I think the that reality, they're steely. Me, I think they're steely. The reality, they're, regardless you know. of their personalities, Harriet makes a very good point. When people get into Parliament, and there'll be a bunch of new MPs if they get a majority. Yeah. Into, There's into, a into, but into, into Parliament, hmm. yeah, they don't know. I mean, I remember this happened in 2010. Hmm. The, the, the revolts only really started happening in 2012. They'll take People the are finding their feet. They're excited that they're, it's a new government. They're excited to be MPs. But you know, the this. people who've been selected now have been selected under this regime. They actually, the Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves regime, they have drunk the Kool-Aid of fiscal responsibility. Ooh. So they're not coming in well, as rebels. Vetted, but we, they're we, not going to find their inner rebel so, because there isn't an inner no, well, rebel there. I, I, I slightly disagree with that because in 2010, we obviously had the party list, David Cameron's people, but there were still people who people you know, were rocking the boat. looking to their but constituency the, and other pressures. That's right. They? And then, you know, you, there's the first reshuffle. People are disappointed. You know, they're getting heat from their constituencies about certain votes. And that's when, you know, after about 18 months, if, if, if there is a new government, I think that's, that, that's when the discontent will start. You and it'll be much more fragile depending on the result of the election. If Labour get a, major, a reasonable majority, I think that means re rebellions are less likely. If it's a hung parliament, anything can happen. Let's have a little look at the long-range election forecast before we go and spin the weather vane a little bit. I mean, Gary, what, what is sort of next on the horizon? If May is just a local election, mm. what comes after that? I wouldn't say just the local elections. <laughs> they, could, they could be quite uh, seismic. The Tories desperately want to hold on to Andy Street in the West Midlands. They, won't, they don't want to be just left with Ben Houchen and Tees Valley, which is where it could be in a bad scenario uh, for the Tories. And... 
One of the reasons why people were talking about an early May election was because a lot of Tories weren't entirely sure Rishi Sunak could make it all the way to the autumn. And those dangers still lurk. There are people close to him are doing, going through the numbers. They think there aren't enough Tory MPs to trigger a vote of no confidence. But if there are close to uh, enough Tory MPs or a trickle of Tory MPs, that can create a, a, a sort of like a sort of grumbling appendix, a, a, a sort of awful sort of chronic condition mm. that just sort of carries on and mm. dominates the news. And that is a danger for him. And all sorts of things are being talked about in Westminster at the moment about that period after May, about how Rishi Sunak might have to threaten an early election in June lie in order to pull his troops together, people muttering about, well, let's have Penny Morden for 100 days, that's got to be better than Rishi Sunak. <laughs> Those things get said. And yes, that yes. is where yeah, that's see. the world we will be in the other side of May, potentially, if the results are as bad as some fear in the Tory party. Quasi Kwarteng, Harriet Harman, Gary Gibbon, thank you all very much indeed. That was the political forecast. Until next time, bye bye.